and we are live. Welcome to Crypto Law TV. I'm John Deaton, the founder and your host. Five days ago, Judge Torres from the Southern District of New York handed down a monumental opinion and decision involving crypto, specifically XRP. So monumental that a congressman has already written Gary Gensler calling it the Torres Doctrine and telling him to back off the Coinbase lawsuit. And so we're going to delve into that decision. But before we get into it and get to my special guest, I want to play a clip before the decision came out of what I thought might happen. I'm confident that the judge will say that secondary market sales are not in play, that secondary market sales of XRP are not securities, that the token itself is not a security. And I say that just because of XRP holders amicus brief, Coinbase amicus brief, Blockchain Association, Digital Chamber of Commerce, and the slew of others, uh, Spin the Bits, and everyone else, that Tap Jets, I remit all of that. There's so much attention on this case. I think she will feel morally obligated to have to address those issues, even though she technically doesn't. If she wanted to try to avoid them, I don't think she will. I think we have a great judge and we will see. Not only did I think we had a great judge, but we had a judge that applied the law. And we're going to talk about that decision. But first, before I bring on my special guest, yesterday on Real Vision, at the end of the clip, I talked about those making a difference. And when you are aggrieved, you have a choice to either sit down and shut up or stand up and be heard. And people were stood, stood up and they were heard. And don't let anyone fool you otherwise. In fact, crypto law brings facts. Let me prove exactly what I'm talking about, uh, how there was a, a difference made by regular people in the crypto industry. I could go on and on throughout the opinion and showed you, but I'm going to highlight three. Let's go to page three of her ruling. And you see there at the bottom where it talks about um, other developers have built software products that use the XRP ledger, such as payment processing applications. Well, who could that be? You see there, there's a site that says paragraph 59. Well, let's go to that site. There is the site. That is a statement that says many other developers with no connection to Ripple have built software products, blah, blah, blah. Look at the site. Proposed intervener's non-exhaustive list of publicly available use cases. What was that? That was me sending a letter about companies such as Spin the Bits, other developers making a payment app. And so in the Spin the Bits amicus brief, look there, you have Jake of Spin the Bits talking about how he never received money from Ripple. He never even talked to Ripple. Ripple didn't even know he existed. He did everything on his own because it's an open, decentralized uh, technology that he built a payment app. That makes a difference. That's the first one. Now, let's go to um, a second one. Let's go to footnote 16 of the decision. Now, you see there at the bottom, the judge highlights the library case. And she highlights, you see there, ECF number 105 at 34. That's the page of the transcript. And she's citing the very lines of that transcript. And you see in the parentheses at the end of the sentence, it says the judge declining to extend holding to secondary cells. Well, let's go to what she's talking about. That's it, ladies and gentlemen, January 30th transcript. And who do you see there? Naomi Brockwell. Naomi Brockwell gave me permission to represent her interest. And that's what we were talking about. Now, let's go to the page of the transcript the judge cites. At the top, before it says the court, that's me talking to the judge saying, I'm asking, Your Honor, if you enter injunctive relief or in the clarification that you state that your ruling has nothing to do with secondary sales. And you see the second highlight under the court, that's what Judge Torres cited. I'm going to make it very clear that nothing in my order has anything to do with secondary sales. It doesn't matter that Judge Barbadero didn't follow through and, and, and write his subsequent order strong, as he said there. Judge Torres cited it. And so if Naomi Brockwell doesn't agree to allow me to go in there 
and she listens to people saying, hey, you shouldn't get involved. Don't highlight your name. It's better to be quiet. Is she to listen to those and not spoke up? That site never happens. That issue, that day in court never happens. And so, Naomi, thank you. I've been getting a lot of praise and a lot of attention. I want to make sure other people that deserve it just as much get it as well. I'm going to the final uh, point that I want to bring up. I want to bring up what I've showed you already, but it's page 24 of her ruling. And on page 24 of her ruling, you see she's talking about programmatic cells. And at the, at the end, she says, in fact, many programmatic buyers were entirely unaware of Ripple's existence. And that last citation, ECF numbers 831-1-831-26. What exactly is that? Let me show you what it is. We have XRP affidavits. The first affidavit, people saying, hey, I bought XRP. I knew that Ripple existed, but I didn't rely on them. And I bought it as an investment. We go to the next one where they don't have knowledge of XRP or they don't have knowledge of Ripple but they still bought it as an investment without knowing about Ripple. Then you got the next one was people saying, hey, I use XRP and I use it as an investment, but I also use it as a debit card or I use it for payment or I use it to transfer money. Then you got another affidavit where the developers, developers like Jay Campbell of Spin the Bit saying, look, I got nothing to do with Ripple, never talked to Ripple, never received any money from Ripple. I'm building an app on the XRP ledger. Then you've got another exhibit that talked about people using the XRP ledger, where they used it to transfer money. And then you've got another one, which was 4B, which was people who used the debt in the XRP ledger. And then we had another exhibit that was Category 5 exhibit, was people saying, hey, I don't need to rely on Ripple. I stake my XRP and I collect money. I collect a profit independent of Ripple. Judge, I don't need Ripple. And then finally, we had another category of people who basically had their XRP frozen because of the SCC's action in Ripple. So that's what I mean. So you all made the uh, ruling. Naomi Brockwell made the ruling. And I want to thank you sincerely because you ignored the naysayers and you stood up for something that you believed in and something that you fought for. So congratulate yourself. I want to thank Jimmy Filan for being my ear picking up my calls at one in the morning when I was pissed off or frantic or not going to meet a deadline. So thank you, Jimmy. And my next guest is someone also who deserves credit because he played a pivotal role in all of this. And I'll explain it and I'll prove it. OK, and that guest is Lewis Cohen. OK, Lewis called me up and said, John, did you see the injunction uh, in the library case? My God, it's bad. It's bad. And so he helped me. And I ended up putting this exhibit as an entire exhibit let's pull up his uh his article first hey lewis right there that was exhibit b to the amicus brief filed by me for for naomi brockwell lewis welcome to the show you're on mute let's not do that mute. there you go yeah okay yeah hey uh, good to be on and good to talk to everybody thanks for having me john no, absolutely. So listen, I just went through a few highlights that you saw with Judge Torres congratulating people. I want to highlight your team as well. It deserves a lot of credit because I know, Lewis, and I can prove that Judge Torres read your brief uh, and that article that I just put up. And the one way I can prove it is that that's that citation to the library hearing that you just saw me put up for everyone. You're one of the few people that have read that entire transcript. I only had a few minutes, as you know, like five minutes to speak. But what did we, him, the judge and I speak about the most when I was on my feet? You spoke about that article. <laughs> I know you're modest. I know you're modest. Yeah, but yeah, yes, yeah. We, we spoke about the article. I said, judge, and the judge told me that he had already read your article. Yep. And, and he was complimentary. And we discussed it. And your article, Lewis, you were someone who coined this phrase called the embodiment theory. And it stems from, um, let's go to my motion to intervene early on in the case and the SEC's response. And there the audience can see that the SEC divulged this theory that the XRP traded even in the secondary market 
is the embodiment of those facts, circumstances, promises, and expectations. And today represents that investment contract. Lewis, I showed that to Paul Graywell at Coinbase as a former judge. And I said, what stood out to you, judge? He said that there was no citation after that sentence. So uh, what made you call it the embodiment theory? And then I'm going to prove how the judge read it. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, John. So thanks. That, that's right. So, I, you know, I love to tell the story because it's kind of more or less how we uh, originally connected. And um, yeah, so I'm a lawyer in private practice. I have my own firm, DLX Law, and we focus on the transactional side, the regulatory side of a variety of crypto things. So, you know, part of our job is to stay on top of things going on. And, you know, with Ripple being a crucial, crucial case, you know, I did my very best to read the various, you know, a million and one right motions and, and orders and different things were going on. And I had on my desk, you know, your motion to intervene and the SEC's response. And, you know, it seemed like kind of secondary at the time. And I'm like, I got to read that at some point, man. But, you know, whatever, it's Friday nights around 11 o'clock. I'm like, I got to read this thing. And I'm reading it and I'm reading it and I'm flipping the pages and it's pretty straightforward. And obviously they, they did not, uh, 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 the SEC rejected the idea of, of you intervening. But I get to the page you just put up on the screen, right? And I read this sentence and I'm like, take it aback. I'm like, hang on a second. What's this all about? This idea that a token, which in and of itself is self-evidently not a security, you know, it could be a jelly bean, it could be anything. It doesn't really matter. It's something that's not a security, whatever it is, right? And you know, the SEC is saying, well, it embodies this kind of investment scheme. And I said, that's just, just not right. And I'd spent a lot of time working with other lawyers in the field and the prevailing view in the legal community since, you know, give or take 2018, I think, when the Hinman speech first came out, the prevailing view was that tokens do embody schemes and that at some point they morph and they're no longer securities and whatever. And I said, this is just not right. And so uh, I'll, I'll go back to you, but that's what was the origin really of kind of driving forward our scholarship uh, and led to the article that you put on the screen. In, in your that article discussed all the appellate cases that dealt with Howie. Is that fair? That's that's right. I mean, we felt that I'd actually written another article, which I I happen to like. You can, you can read, read that one too uh, about Broadway tickets because the prior chair Jay Clayton had used an analogy twice, where he said, "Well, tokens are kind of like Broadway tickets." And I'm like, "Again, well, hey, let's slow down there, Haas. You know, let's <laughs> let's take a look at that." Um, so we'd already written one article, but I felt that more was needed. You know, you know, going back and really we started working on this article with the odd name and electable modality. We started working on it about three years ago. And the reason was because we really saw what was coming, which was this fundamental showdown, which manifested itself ultimately in SEC versus Coinbase versus Binance versus Bittrex versus the exchanges that if each and every one of these tokens are securities, the whole system of crypto does not work. And look, if it doesn't work because that's the law, that's the way it goes. But it's not the law. It's the law being wrongly interpreted. And so the only way, John, for us to make that case was the mic drop, right? You know, boom. You know, we've read every single case. Not most of them, not a lot of them, every single one. And we annex them. It's very transparent. It's free to the world. Anybody, you know, can put a, a link in the show notes. Anybody can go look at it, analyze it, and thinking about it. And we felt that was the level of transparency needed. If you're going to tell the SEC that they don't have it right, you better be sure you got it right. You know, absolutely. What people need to know is that your brief, that article was an exhibit to other amicus briefs in the Ripple case. Yep. Uh, my my amicus brief was written before I could cite it, but then I cited it in the library case. And so we know the judge read the transcript where me and the judge are talking about your article. And we know that article was also submitted in the Ripple case as an exhibit. And here's the proof that the judge actually adopted your, you know, your phrase, I will, of the embodiment theory. If we can go to uh, her decision, page 15, where she says XRP as a digital token is not in and of itself a contract transaction or scheme that embodies the Howery requirements of an investment contract. So she literally uses the word embodies and smacks it down. And so I just have to ask you before we get to the overall ruling, you know, you put a lot of work. You talk about three years. How gratifying is? I know you're a modest guy, and we'll put you on the spot. But how gratifying is it to know that um, that you made a difference? No, it's it's great. I mean, it's similar to you. I think that's why kind of how we bonded, right? You know, I think it's a space, and you've really emphasized this to the XRP community, and you just even at the top of the show, right? 
regular people can get involved and make a difference. And I think that's in some ways characteristic what crypto is all about, right? It's like this resetting of the relationship between the government and the individual. And, you know, in our case, we said, look, we're a small law firm. We're reasonably well respected, but we're going to make a difference here and we're going to do the work and we're going to put it out there and we're going to see what happens. It was immensely gratifying. I mean, let's be honest. And I got I really appreciate it. Many, many people called me up and said, hey, Lewis, I mean, that's exactly what you've been talking about. You crazy nut for the last three years. I've been sick of listening to you saying this. And there's the judge, because I think it's the right reading of law, most importantly. And we'll talk about policy issues, which are significant. But you know, in terms of the law as it stands today, Judge Torres made the right reading, and you know, I'm very, very gratified about that. Well, great, uh, and you deserve it, and and it shows you sometimes immensely hard work pays off, and so congratulations. So let's talk about, you know, I brought you on because no one has can no one else that I know can say I read every case, not partially, but every case citing Howie and the Howie test. So I just want to give the floor to you for for you to explain. Uh, what your overall thoughts, knowing the case law so well, knowing the Howie test so well, uh, what you think Judge Torres did and, and, and how she got it. Yeah, that's great, John. And look, you know, I'm a lawyer, you're a lawyer, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of lawyers listening. I, I want to make this break this down a little bit more basic. So most folks can kind of understand what we're talking about here, right? So I'm going to try and be, and look, call me out if you think I'm being too technical, right? But I want to try and kind of break it down for for folks, right? So why, let's just just like pause for a second. Well, why are we even having this discussion, right? So, you know, before the big stock market crash, right? Before that, there was no federal law securities. And like when we think about it, there's a lot of things that are only regulated at the state level. And before, you know, 1929, securities was one of them. You know, obviously things went rather wrong after the crash and all these things. And people said, man, those security markets are really messed up. We need to regulate them federally. And so when Congress did that, they said, well, if we're going to regulate them, we kind of, we got to know what we're regulating here, right? What? exactly is a security. So, you know, part of that's easy, right? Well, a stock, you know, it's a security. Come on, right? We're good there. A bond, a note, various things. But the Congress, even back then, understood that if you just define securities in a really kind of precise and narrow way, people do workarounds, right? As people like to do. Okay, well, you know, it's not a stock, don't you see? So we're not covered by this law. And they wanted the law to be inclusive. And so they borrowed from state law and they picked up this idea of an investment contract. And they said, we're going to throw that in there to make sure that whatever goes on, you know, we've got that covered at the federal level and nobody's going to pull a fast one on us here. And so about seven or eight years went by and nobody actually really knew what that meant. You know, that's the only problem. They borrowed it from state law, but nobody knew what it meant. And the Supreme Court eventually got around in a very famous case. I think everybody's heard of at this point, SEC versus the W.J. Howey company with the Orange Groves and all that. And the SEC said, OK, this is it. We're going to tell you what we think Congress means by this term investment contract. And they came up with the four part phrase. I think again, almost everybody's heard investment of money in a common enterprise with reasonable expectation of profit, primarily from the efforts of others. We now have 70, 80 years of cases trying to parse, well, what, all right, fair enough. You got the four pieces. What does it really mean, right? In the context. And so as you read all of the cases, what comes very, very, very clear is what courts are trying to do is stop fundraising schemes where people go out and say, hey, give me money. I'm going to do something with your money and you're going to have more later. You don't have to worry about it. You just enjoy yourself over there. I'm going to do the work over here. And later, you know, we're all in this thing together. We're going to make a lot of money. And there are many, many, many schemes. It's really kind of interesting sort of human little story there of every which thing people used, animals being grown for their pelts, whiskey being aged, as I'm sure many people probably know by now, all kinds of schemes. The point is, John, none of these schemes is the thing, the object, right? A security. You don't need the object to be a security. What you need is a scheme where somebody basically, you've arranged say, hey, give me money. I'm going to give you something. I'm going to drive the value. When digital assets came along, people sort of somehow or another kind of broke that framework and said, no, don't you see the digital asset? is the security, and then maybe later it stops being a security. The problem with that, John, is that people don't really even understand what a digital asset is. It's a number, you know? It's a number that lets you give an instruction 
to a network of computers, whatever you want to say about a number, it's not a security. You know, it's it's a number. That's what you got. It may be a valuable number. You know, it's like the secret codes, valuable number, but it's a number, right? And so that's what Judge is talking about. It's not the embodiment of anything. And so, but you know, after Bill Hinman wrote the speech that you know the XRP community is very familiar with now, yes, um, he like took this different view because he wanted to solve this problem, right? He said like, well, everybody's talking about ether and what's up with ether, and they had this ICO, but now it's not. And and look, I think he did a really good job of trying to figure out how do you sort of rationalize this. He said, well, maybe when it was first sold, it was sold in a securities transaction, but now it's not. And did this whole thing blossomed out of that. And everybody said, well, when are you decentralized? And how do I know? And what do I have to do? And as a lawyer, people kept coming to me, Lewis, what do I have to do to be decentralized? And look, that's the position that the SEC took, a lot of people took. We said, that's just not how the law should work. That's not how the law does work. The law looks at what the asset is. If the asset's not a security, it's not a security. And so we really, we tried to drive that with our article. If for folks, I really, people say it's 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 long, but it's readable, you know, take it to the beach or something. Um, <laughs> you know, um, we use as an analogy, um, somebody who comes up with a new type of fruit because the orange has got a little worn out. So we came up with a straw orange, right? It's a half a strawberry, half an orange. And the idea was because digital assets are really unique kinds of assets and the XRP community knows this very well. It, before you create a digital asset, nobody's heard of it. Nobody cares about it. Nobody knows about it. So analogizing, say, well, an orange is not a security. It doesn't quite fit, right? Because everybody knows what an orange is. With a digital asset, people have to market it. And that, those are the efforts that, that folks are concerned about. But once the asset starts trading, it's just what it is. And that's really what we tried to bring out with a wide variety of examples. So you know, we hope that we're resetting the conversation now. This does not mean there are not policy issues. And I know, John, you're going to want to get to that. But just as a framework, so people kind of understand what we're talking about and why, I hope that like in kind of plain terms helps people, you know, kind of understand a little better. Well, here's, here's my position. And I'm going to show something uh, in a second. But my when I read this decision, I just said, look, this judge strictly applied those factors that you mentioned to each type of cell alleged by the SCC. That's all she did. She didn't do anything more. She didn't do anything less. And when she saw that one factor didn't apply, Howie Test wasn't satisfied. In fact, all that matters, am I wrong about that? That no. all that matters is the test. That's exactly right. And, it, and, and it's, it, it's a conjunctive test. All four have to be present. So exactly as you said, John, if one factor is not present, then you don't have the SEC's definition of this investment contract or investment scheme. So, yes. so let's, let's go to the Howey ruling, if we can, just above the dissenting opinion. And right there it says, we reject the suggestion of the circuit court that an investment contract is necessarily missing when enterprise is not speculative or promotional in character, blah, blah, blah. The second sentence is, the test is whether the scheme involves an investment of money in a common enterprise with profits to come solely from the efforts of others. If that test be satisfied, it is immaterial whether the enterprise is speculative or non-speculative or whether the sale of the property is with or without intrinsic value. And so that's the point being because you hear even the judge talked about, well, targeting speculators is not enough. Whether it's speculative or not, doesn't matter. Are the factors satisfied in the test? And if they're not, that's it. And so when I looked at her decision, I saw it as a sound application, you know, not get into policy considerations, just a sound application of those factors to the types of cells. Is that how you read it? Absolutely. I want to put a gloss on it, and I am going to get a little more technical, just a little bit. Um, and don't don't everybody go turn off your TVs, right? Um, you know, but there's a really important underlying principle here, and that is that you know, um, you know, Ripple and their counsel and a number of other market participants who've been fighting with the SEC have focused on is there a contract? And I don't think that's the critical critical issue. The most critical issue is can a market participant, and this is particularly, John, when we're talking about secondary sales, right? Just regular right. folks, right? Can a, some market participant look at the asset 
and determine from the face of the asset whether or not it is a security. Because the way our securities laws work, they have what, John, you know, is a strict liability. That is to say, you don't get to say, well, I wasn't sure. I didn't know. It was confusing. That's that doesn't cut it, right? Strict liability. So for example, if you're running a marketplace of sneakers and you got, you know, some Supremes and you got some Adidas and Nikes and you're trading them and you're making a market and a price and this shoe was this bid ask, you could do that until you're blue because sneakers are not securities, right? If you're doing that with securities and you're not registered as a national securities exchange, you're in big trouble. And the SEC has said, hey, Coinbase, hey, and impliedly, you know, they said it to Binance, they said it to Coinbase, and they applied it to everybody else. Hey, you guys are running a marketplace of securities and you're not registered. So the key thing is, and, and this, the you know, Coinbase in particular has hammered on, how are we meant to know for a given asset, if it's the embodiment of a scheme, what started the scheme? When did the scheme stop? How do I know what that is? And I think if I have a criticism of Judge Torres's ruling, which is fantastic, you know, I would have focused more on the common enterprise element because that's really, I think, what she's getting at here. You know, when a market participant, when you, your brother, you know, your friend Joe down the block, when they're trading XRP, and it's exactly as you said, they're not an enterprise with anybody else. Maybe they're thinking about Ripple Labs. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're aware of what Brad Garlinghouse said. Maybe they're not. They don't know. They don't care. They're not aware of it. And to put them in a strict liability position is just not the way the law can, should, and does work. So I think it's that strict liability element of our securities laws that requires you to have a definition that people interpret, not something where, well, one guy had a tweet once with some rocket ships in it. You didn't notice that? You missed that? Oh, sorry, because that made it a security. That's ridiculous. Right. And we're going to talk more about that. So here's the thing I'm going to say. Um, we know that the test must be met. If it's met, it's met. If it's not, it's not. Uh, whether it's speculative is immaterial, whether the digital token or the orange grove has intrinsic value is, is immaterial. I'll add one more thing, and you, you tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, whether or not it's consistent result with the intent of the policy of 1934 securities laws is not what the judge is supposed to do. So let's just yeah. talk. That's my you opinion. Know, but go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. It's, sorry, we're going to finish the thought? No, no yeah. No, I want, yeah, I want, yeah. Do you disagree or agree? I agree with you, I think, to a point, right? Okay. And I think it, it is to a point. You know, the whole concept here is to protect investors and there is there is a policy principle and i think you want to be aligned with that principle i'd say it's less per se a problem with the principle of, of protecting investors and more competing principles that's the issue because on the one hand there's a principle of protecting investors on the other hand market participants have to know whether they can comply with the law. When those two things clash, right, that's where you have a problem. So if all you had to do is say, we want to protect investors, well, fair enough. But that's not how the securities laws work. You've got to compete. You've got to look at other market participants, other players in this and what's what's fair on all sides. And so I think when you add it up like that, you can't just impose on somebody. And look, as an example, you know, somebody said, well, look, everybody knows Ripple is promoting this. Well, you know, what if Ripple wound up their business, right? They just wound up their business and Brad goes this way, Chris goes, they all go in their separate directions. They start up other businesses. Does that mean the scheme stopped or does, this, does it mean somebody's promoting it? Like you can't know. And I think so there is a policy of investor protection and judges can, should and do look to that. But that's not the only thing. That's the way I'd put it, John. It's not the well, only let, thing. Let me ask you this. There was a lot of criticism that her decision should be overturned because it's inconsistent. I heard the word backwards, perverse uh, is totally. another word because because she found investment contracts with the institutional sophisticated sales, but not the exchange sales. And just as someone who knows the law as well as you do, what's your response when someone says, oh, it's inconsistent. So she got it wrong. Boulder Dash. It's just, you know, that's just, just, that's just, just people, you know, that, you know, that's a sore loser. That's just a sore loser. I'm sorry. You got it wrong. And now you're kind of grasping at straws here. Um, and the, whose responsibility is it though? Yeah. So Congress. So I, I think that's exactly right. And many people, including if you could somehow or another make it all the way to the end of our article, it's on like page 108. So you got to really, you know, have that second cup of coffee folks. 
And but you get to it and we say, look, there are important policy issues here. They're just not covered by the law as it stands today. And I think if there was a strategic mistake that the SEC made, they said, look, no, we don't need any new laws. All of this is already covered. Well, you do need new laws. And that's fine. That's OK to say, hey, we need new laws. I think we do. And if you look at both the um, House market structure proposal and the Senate's Lummis Gillibrand uh, Responsible Financial Innovation Act, both of them have different ways of broadly coming at the same thing, because the idea is like, hey, if there's an asset and in Howie terms, right, the value of the asset is dependent on the essential managerial efforts of others. I think it is the appropriate response to acquire those others, whether it's Ripple Labs, the company, whether it's any of these other companies participating in the market, to provide disclosures that are fulsome, accurate, and under penalty of significant federal consequence if they're mistaken or misleading. And I think I've talked to a lot of market participants. They support that, right? We just don't have that right now. We don't have that for assets that are not securities. And I think you see it most clearly in the Lummis Gillibrand. If you look at Title V of Lummis Gillibrand, it basically comes right out and follows this line of reasoning. Hey, if there's a digital asset, which was referred to as ancillary assets for various reasons, if there's a digital asset out there, somebody's providing essential managerial efforts, it's trading above some sort of de minimis amount, and you're providing essential managerial efforts, you are obliged to file reports with the SEC and provide those disclosures. It also, uh, that act creates um, a federal regulation of secondary marketplaces. I think when you do that, you've addressed the policy issues. So it's not that there aren't policy issues, it's just they need to be addressed in a way that's consistent with the law. No, I agree. And the final comment I would say about those saying that, that it's perverse or she got it wrong I go back to the Howey test, and the last time I checked, there isn't a factor of what's the sophistication level of the investor. Absolutely. It's just not there. 100% you know, 100% I mean, right, John. And and look, you know, it's it's a shame. And like we've been in clubhouse rooms, we've been playing, you know, a lot of people get twisted around and told you need to buy this or buy that. And it's really bad. But we also, I think the other thing, John, that happens is that we get this idea that if it's not the federal government, there's no remedy at all. We have state attorneys general. We have a lot of different means. The Federal Trade Commission has intervened now for the first time. This SEC is not the only body from a law law enforcement point of view, they'd say, hey, if you're ripping people off, if you're saying, man, you know, I guarantee, you know, XRP is going to go up 500% the next two weeks, I promise you that and do something, whatever, you know, they're going to get in trouble and they should get in trouble. And whether it's XRP or anything else. So I think the idea that we have no remedies for bad actors in the space right. is just a lie. And I think we've seen the Department of Justice get involved without triggering our securities laws. They got involved with this guy, Ishan Wahi, who was the insider trader on yeah. Coinbase, and they prosecuted him completely satisfactorily without ever once saying that the tokens he traded on Coinbase were securities. You know, we've right. seen over and over again. So we don't need, I think it's, 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 completely misleading. And there are a number of folks out there, as you may know on Twitter and LinkedIn, who sort of suggest that if the SEC isn't there, all hell's going to break loose. Right. So they, eh, it's just not right. You know, come on, guys. No, come on. Absolutely. And the, um, I mean, the other thing that, the final thing about the policy is in, in the 1934, when the act was enacted, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have Google. It's not the same day. And to unfairly put on this federal district judge that she's got to somehow come up with a result consistent with policy from the 30s, to me is absurd. But let me ask you, I think we have a disagreement on one thing. Uh, what do you think is the weakest, because you and I talked a little bit before, what do you think is the weakest part of her decision? Yeah, discussion isn't good if we can't disagree about something, man. Absolutely. You gotta disagree. So yeah, for me, the part that concerns me the most that I do think is the weakest is she broke the sales down. I think at this point, everybody's on 500 podcasts. So you've heard all the thing, but right. There's the institutional sales, the programmatic sales, and then the other distributions. And the other distributions are when you use the token, in that case, the XRP token to compensate either employees or contractors or third parties or whatever it may be. Hey, have a bunch of my tokens in lieu of me paying you. The judge reasons that those are not investment contract transactions because one of the you know uh, things that you need is an investment of money and somebody needs to provide capital into a venture. And like, well, if you're just working, you're not providing capital, you know, right? And, and I think that's a little facile if you ask me, if for my view, right? Because it's a barter transaction, right? That if somebody accepted tokens, they're accepting less fiat money. And if they're accepting less fiat money, that's fiat money that the project, whether it's Ripple or anybody else, 
that the project is keeping for themselves. So functionally, the absence of taking capital away, you know, if you know taking capital away or putting capital in, they're two sides of the same coin. So for me, that's a that's a weak point there. But you know, we'll see. I know there's you've got a different point of view on the subject. Well, well, just a point. If we could go to page twenty six of her ruling. Um, she uh, she basically says here, she says that in every case, there's some tangible consideration. Now, I do wish that she would have cited some of the other cases that sweat equity type of uh, consideration. But when you go to the next page on 27, she says, quote, as a factual matter, there is no evidence that the SEC points to. And what's interesting is the SEC in their opposition they later change their theory. And she even notes that and says the SEC pivots. And so the reason why I believe it, it's not, uh, it may be the weakest, but I, I don't think it's something that's going to get touched is because she's basing it on a factual issue that the SEC didn't develop the record. And they almost acknowledged that and then flipped and said, well, no, that was a scheme to enter the secondary market using those employees and others as underwriters. And then she goes, well, you didn't develop that theory. You just threw that out there in your opposition. And so I don't think there's enough for the appellate court to reach down and say she got it wrong. Although I would have wished she maybe done a few more citations acknowledging the sweat equity type cases. But other than that, it's a slight disagreement, I guess. But uh, I always like to highlight those. Now, um, the one thing I do want to highlight is that when we talk about the secondary sales, if we go to page 24, um, and, and I'm not gonna go through it all, but if when you look at page 24 and page 25 of her ruling, the SEC, and I made a big deal about this, Lewis, in the amicus brief, which was the SEC cited Chris Larson's tweet. You brought up Twitter, a tweet from 2014. And I pointed out that the six XRP holders that were, that were amicus named, we were not, none of them were on Twitter back in 2014. She talked about a hundred brochures that were sent to potential or investors. Um, and she said those may have been investment contracts because there is communication between them. The but transactions were the investment right. contracts. And it's something, the you and I, the something you and I talked about, and I cited this in the Mika's brief. There isn't a case in history where there's zero privity between the promoter, you know, seller and the buyer. And so um, to me, it was the it was always the SEC trying to use these generalized statements and then assuming that they could make the connection. And one thing I would point out for everyone is the SEC acknowledged this weakness. And that's when they had an expert and they had an expert who was expected, and he did testify at his deposition as to what the reasonable XRP purchaser would have, quote, unquote, believed or relied on. Well, we got, we helped get him struck. And the SEC lost that witness and they couldn't rely on him. And once they couldn't rely on him, all they had was these general, like, they sent a brochure in 2014. There was a, a tweet in 2015. Brad Garlinghouse gave a speech in 2015. There's no connection there that allowed the secondary purchasers to, to rely on. It was just an overwhelming assumption, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, and, I, I'd agree with that, John. I, 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 I know you used the word privity and you used it sort of in a more general term. Right. Privity is usually associated again with contractual privity. Hey, I signed something, you signed something, we both signed something. And on uh, and uh, since we're quoting pages, I'll say on page 49 of Ineluctable Modality, um, we talk about that. And what we say is, look, what, what, what did we find? We found that there is always the minimum. Is there some direct business relationship between the sponsor and the participant? We give the example of a case actually unpublished out of the Fifth Circuit called Shaw versus Hiawatha. That's uh, uh, footnote 149 if you're following in your prayer books at home. And, uh, <laughs> and we say that in that case, the court noted that the plaintiffs alleged that defendant's agents 
told them they would, quote, be in business together, coupled with a letter from an officer of the defendant stating that he was looking forward to, quote, a long and profitable relationship. So they never actually had a contract, but they right. had this business relationship. So I think the law can and should be flexible as to those matters, it, particularly because they come up with there's like an alleged fraud, right? Like, oh, you can't use the absence of a contract to sort of work around a fraud. Like, well, you know, I'm defrauding you, John, right? But I never signed an agreement with you. So I guess no investment contract. That's not the right result. So I think you have to look at that. But it's as you contrast the secondary market purchasers, they're in a completely different position because they have no relationship with Ripple Labs. I think that's kind of the core thing. And so they have nothing to attach to. So but is there a policy concern? Absolutely. You know, should it be addressed through Congress? That's the right venue. And she acknowledged, in her opinion, she said some XRP purchasers on the secondary market may, you know, but there just, you just, there was not enough connection there. We're going to wrap it up, but we got to talk about appeal, right? And I want to explain for everyone, um, I believe it's 10 days they have to file a notice for an interlocutory appeal. So we'll be, you know, getting very close to whether that's going to happen. What people need to understand is that in order for an interlocutory appeal, Judge Torres has to agree to it. She has to give the SEC permission. And I would assume Ripple would object to that because on appeal, I believe this case, you know, there's no such thing as, oh, no case, you know, I'm not going to call it appeal proof, but I believe that it's going to be affirmed and we're going to talk about that, including the that ripple violated the law i think that would be as well and so uh but an interlocutory appeal only happens if the sec gets permission from the judge and their whole theory was in fact let's talk about how it affects coinbase real quick because in the coinbase transcript and i know you've read it from the previous hearing the judge uh asked how do you distinguish these assets Exactly. And what te- and the and the SEC said, I advise everyone to read the Howey case. And so, why should there be a, this unclear interlocutory appeal when it's just strict application of Howey that the SEC believes gives enough guidance to everyone in the world? You know. Yep. And so, um, but what that is, is your view? Point. Yeah. What What is your view? And then I'm going to talk about one other thing about the appeal. But what is your view? I know I'm not asking you to guess, but there have been a lot of people that have like immediately said, oh, this is going to be reversed. You know? Yeah, no, I, I, I certainly don't think so. And I, I think we didn't maybe at the top give our, our disclaimers. Nothing in here is legal advice. I'm not your lawyer. Get your own lawyer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> not predicting anything. So well, I'm kind of some of their lawyers. Well, you might be some of them. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I might have some clients listening. I have no idea. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, uh, you know, I think on the core part of her decision, I don't think either side uh, is going to win. I, I listened to another podcast uh, this morning in which someone thought the fair notice defense was relevant. The fair notice defense is not relevant. I'm sorry to say here, guys. It's not because the part that uh, Ripple's asked, I don't know. Ripple lost on has nothing to do with the digital asset being unique or different. It has to do with, was there something? Yes, there was something, whatever it was, right? Did people give you money? Did they expect a profit? And they, did they expect a profit from your efforts? And were they in a common enterprise with you? All those answers are yes. I don't think this has anything to do. I'm sorry, guys. Love you. Ripple Labs, that does not have anything to do with the fair notice defense. I do want to call out really super quick one thing, because it, it does come up, and one of your uh, uh, viewers uh, just said it, a, a popular commentator uh, compared XRP to Apple stock, and I think a lot of people have seen that. And I think, yep. again, I think I just want to really quickly call this out, because a lot of people have seen that. you got to understand what a token is. It's a number. What is stock? Stock is the evidence of a legal relationship right? There is no legal relationship. You may say that's a dumb thing. And why would you ever buy a number that doesn't give you a legal relationship? You know, it's a fair point. I don't know. But it's not stock. Stock, whether it's certificated, that is to say there's a piece of paper or uncertificated, there's no paper, no nothing. When you're an owner of stock, you have a legal relationship with that company. You can vote in meetings and shareholder meetings. You have certain rights to dividends when they're declared. Um, There's certain rights as a minority shareholder in a, a winding up of the company. You have a lot of different rights. You have 
for better or worse, where most tokens, including XRP, you don't have any rights. And that is, it's fundamentally different. And that's why, John, I just really want to hit this point on the head. Absolutely. When you pick up a digital asset like an XRP token, you can't tell from that number what piece somebody said, whether it was in 2015 on Twitter or last week at a conference, you don't know that. When you pick up a share of Apple stock, you do know exactly what relationship you have with the issuer. Tokens do not have issuers. Another one of Lewis's hobby horse points, right? There's no issuer. There's a seller because there's no relationship. So I think that, like, I hope if your listeners take like one thing away from that, that's really a key point. No, that's outstanding. In fact, uh, one of the premises of why I did my motion to intervene is I said, look, Judge, part of Ripple's defense is they owe nothing to XRP holders. They know, offer no legal rights. They offer no equity. They offer nothing. And so we should be heard because it's almost like part of their defense is to prove they owe us nothing. And so, no, I'm glad that you made that point. I do want people to know that uh, because they think that if there was an appeal and Judge Torres were to get overturned or vacated, that that would be the end of it. No, 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 no. Because I would advise them to look at footnote 13 where she says the court holds only that a common enterprise existed between Ripple and the institutional buyers. The court does not reach the question of whether the common enterprise extends to encompass other XRP holders, Garlinghouse and Larson, the XRP ecosystem or other entities. So in the crazy event that you and I are wrong and she was vacated, it actually would go back to her where she would have to reapply the other factors and she could find that there is no common enterprise between XRP hopes in the secondary market and Ripple, right? Two <laughs> more so, years later or whatever it may be, right? right? Exactly. So, that's, that, that's, so, a, that's a great point, John. And I, I think a really, really important one um, in terms of the pickle that, um, you know, the SEC find themselves in. And I would argue, you know, again, I have, I have good friends at the SEC you know, as an institution, I have nothing but respect, but, you know, even like your friends can sometimes a little bit misfire. And right. I think this is a, this is a pickle of their own making at this time. Yeah. And, and so the, and the other thing I would point out, I, I did a little bit of research just because I like facts, right. Instead of just all opinion. And uh, there were six decisions, summary judgment decisions um, looked at, at the second circuit from judge Torres, all six were confirmed uh, out of 29 cases. There were six that had partially vacated on very technical rules. She's got a pretty good track record. Now, I do want to ask you because there's been discussion of the the value of this. We all, would you could see the Southern District of New York is pretty much a a, the, a solid jurisdiction for financial markets. It's oh, it, I mean, it's, it's really the leading episode. the leading market. Yeah. Right. The leading so, district, excuse me. So um, do you think that the other federal district, because obviously it's not binding authority, even on a fellow district judge, but do you have any opinion on the impact this decision has on the other judges, maybe the Coinbase judge? Well, certainly other judges in the same district are going to have to think really long and hard before they go against one of their respected colleagues and reach a different conclusion on more or less the same facts. You know, I, I, I'm not a litigator, John, so I, I can't say, does that never happen? I'm sure from time to time, there's just a, a strong disagreement. And look, you did that, you know, you, you see it sometimes on appellate cases where somebody files a dissent, right? I'm, I respect you a lot. I'm just really disagree. So certainly can happen. But, you know, judges are going to only do that, you know, when they feel really strongly about the matter. Now, when you move outside of the Southern District of New York to other districts, and in fact, so Binance is pending in the D.C. District. Right. Um, the Bittrex case is pending, I believe, in the Western District of Washington State. Those that's a kind of different situation. Now, that's you know, you're much more remote. You're certainly going to be aware of it. I'm sure the various defendants are going to be making that, you know, point one as they argue their cases. Right. But those judges are not are, you know, they could say, wow, those New York people, why do they know? They like the Yankees, man. Why do we know about them? Right. So so I think you can potentially see 
uh, different results. And ultimately, that's why our federal system works the way it does. These roll up into the various circuit courts when they're appealed. And if they're what we call a split in the circuits, disagreements, the Second Circuit and the Ninth Circuit, for example, disagree, you know, usually, but not always, usually or often, maybe I wouldn't even say usually, the Supreme Court will weigh in and say, we recognize there's there, the different circuits are, are in different directions. Once the Second Circuit rules in any direction, and just to be super clear for non-lawyers, the Southern District of New York is within the Second Circuit, which is, again, right. a, a, a prominent circuit. Once, uh, the, If there is a final order, ultimately, um, a final judgment, I should say, in the Second Circuit, that will be binding on all districts within that circuit unless and until something dramatically changes, at least as to those facts. Right. Which brings us, we're going to wrap up, but it brings us to a couple questions. Uh, one of the questions, will the SEC a, appeal this order? Do you think we'll see an interlocutory appeal or you just have no opinion? Gosh, I don't. You know, it's, it's, I think you, you really explained it very well, John. It's a tricky um, issue for them. It puts them in a, different, a difficult doctrinal, like, why are you doing this interlocutory appeal? Um, you, know, you know, I mean, one potential result is to offer to Garlinghouse and Larson a settlement that's very satisfactory to them. That's yep. sort of like, well, look, here's how it goes. <laughs> we'll basically drop everything. And once that is done, then it's no longer interlocutory because there's no more uh, uh, tribal issues of fact. And at that point, they can appeal as a matter of right. So that's another, but now they may be reluctant to do that for a variety right. of issues. So it, it's a complicated dynamic in terms of where it goes. And I'll say one more time, not a litigator. So <laughs> yes, just don't listen. Whatever I say right from now on, just pay no attention. Other than follow me on Twitter and uh, NY Crypto Absolutely. Lawyer. But other than that, just don't listen to anything else. I well, say. the one th the one thing I would say, I said this on Twitter. If I'm representing, you know, Garling House or Larson and the SEC files an interlocutory appeal. I'm pounding the table. I'm objecting to it, even though they didn't get, you know, obviously everything they wanted and saying there was a two and a half year investigation, a two and a half year litigation. This is a dark cloud of five years over my clients. We want our day in court. We want them to prove recklessness, which we don't think they can. We want a trial date as soon as possible, not an allocatory appeal. That's what John Deaton would do. But, you know, I'd rather talk to you <laughs> here today. So uh, I don't I don't think that she'll grant uh, interlocutory appeal. Um, is there any do one or two more questions before we wrap it up? Um, any questions? Uh, when will the trial and aiding and abetting start? Uh, I can't guess on that other than next year at some point, I would assume, based on the judge's uh, calendar and trial calendar. Uh, but it's, it's certainly not before this year. Does the ruling mean U.S. banks can immediately start using XRP without legal risk? That's a great question, but it certainly sounds like that they could use XRP if they acquired it off an exchange in a blind bid ask format. But right now, um, if they have a contract with Ripple for that purchase, even though ODL, if they only own it temporarily, uh, it would meet her definition of an investment contract, uh, uh, in my opinion. I don't know what you think, uh, Lewis. Yeah, I mean, that's a tricky one. I think, you know, uh, some of your folks may be a, a aware of this, but regulation of banks is very different from other types of regulations called prudential regulation. And in, in the scheme, and that's appropriate, right? They, they're holding our money. So they're subject to a very different type of regulation. If, if the prudential regulators, the Federal Reserve, the Office of the Control of the Currency, you know, uh, state uh, prudential regulators, and of course, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, um, if they don't want a bank to do something, bank's not going to be doing it. You know, so I think, and and what we saw really post FTX was a, a intense clampdown on bank integration with all digital assets, all crypto assets. And look, there's some good reasons for that. I'm not, you know, going to express a value judgment, but I would not hold my breath on whether, again, it's nothing, it's really not a statement about XRP per se, and more that there's a lot of concern in the bank regulatory community about how crypto assets interact with banks. And I don't see that uh, changing anytime soon. The SEC also adopted something they called Staff Accounting Bulletin 121 or SAV 121. That is a huge issue here because under that accounting position, banks that are part of a public holding company, which is most banks, um, cannot provide uh, custody services 
unless they functionally hold capital against the assets that they're custodying, which is if, as if they own them. Functionally, it's a long, we do a whole other show on that. Um, but the net result is even independent of everything else, SAB 121 can have a very dramatic impact on banks holding uh, crypto assets on custody for others. That doesn't mean, just to be clear, for themselves, but on custody for others. So I'd be cautious about, you know, expecting major changes in the bank community. And again, I'm not speaking specifically to XRP, but uh, across the digital asset landscape. All right. One last question. And that question, uh, which highlights the difference between the library case and this uh, Ripple case, uh, the question was, does the order affect Ripple's XRP escrow? And uh, the escrow is not even referenced or mentioned in Judge Torres's ruling, yet in the library decision, of course, the fact that the uh, library owns some pre-mine, you know, and I thought the judge in library got it wrong in a, because he was confusing a common interest with a common enterprise. Just because you own the asset, you know, again, I go back to Howie Lewis and that, you know, there, there's nothing prong about you know escrow it's just the facts right and yeah so any thoughts on 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 that do you think the judge got it right right by ignoring the escrow in her opinion yeah i don't think i think you 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 nailed it john it's not so much the escrow it's the fundraising sale and so right. you know in library library really didn't have or at least was not able to articulate to the judge a clear business model of their own and maybe that was going to develop and who knows, right? But they didn't really articulate that. And so as a, as a result, if, if what you're doing is selling tokens, you know, and many projects is not unique to library in any way, that those ongoing fundraising sales are equally problematic, you know, if from, from a securities law point of view. So I think that's really where the rub is. It's not so much holding the pre-mine per se, but which is the common interest, as you said, John. But right. you know, if you do other fundraising, so so you know, we tell projects think long and hard. If you're going to issue a token, what is your business model? How's that going to work independent of holding you know pre-mined tokens? And I think it's the the right result. I also just like just as we wrap up here, like really want to reemphasize the importance of decentralization. It's a critical concept philosophically and commercially in the crypto asset space. It just shouldn't be the parameter or the deciding factor on whether a particular asset is or is not a security. And we really, you know, again, for me, one of the big takeaways from Judge Torres' decision is decentralization makes one half of a sort of sliding, you know, appearance once. You know, it's just not a factor. And I think, you know, for a lot of folks, they pinned all their hope on this idea, well, don't you see, once you're decentralized, you're okay. And it's not about that. It's really more about you know, are you fundraising? How are you, how are you interacting uh, with the, uh, with the token? Absolutely. Well, one thing I know that frustrated you and I, because I remember we're listening to Hester Purse on the Thinking Crypto channel, and this was, you know, a year and a half ago, and she, she kept saying, well, my colleagues keep talking about the token itself as a shortcut and not the circumstances around it. So, and I just was like, that's not the way it's supposed to be, you know, and I'm not even a career securities lawyer. And so, the fact that we have clarity to the extent that we do today uh, in a large part is due to your efforts. And I wanted to bring you on. I wanted to highlight that because I can't even imagine the amount of work that you put into that article. And it's a beautiful reference piece. I've went to it so many times. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you. You've been a friend to me. You, you, you've taken my cause when I've had questions about case law and whatnot. And I hope that you are, um, I hope that you're enjoying the fruit of your hard work. That's very kind, John. And yes, and look, we're we're all in this together, right? And that's I think that's for me what what drew me and many other people into the crypto space. It's this sense of community. I've made so many friends. I'm blessed, you know, to have you as a friend and many, many others. And we support each other, we learn from each other, we question each other. I have a number Absolutely. of friends that question me all the time, like, are you out of your mind, buddy? And that's okay, that's fine, because we ultimately reach uh, better results. So thank you so much for having me on your show. Thank you to everybody who's kind of stayed tuned toward the end. Also, just a Shout out since you 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 invoke the name of Commissioner Purse, who's just a wonderful person, a great scholar and thinker, and she really deserves a shout out of her own for really being Absolutely. a leading light uh, throughout this process. So just give her a you know a bonus shout out as, as and if any congressmen or senators are watching, get in touch with Lewis, please, <laughs> and let him walk you through uh, getting some sensible legislation. I know that you do 
you get called those calls uh, regularly. And um, I'm looking forward to you helping draft legislation that gets passed that, that lets this space uh, innovate and uh, we move forward. Thanks, Lewis. We innovate Appreciate safely it. and responsibly. You bet. Absolutely. Okay, John. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you next week.